to connect a region of over 600 million bridges between our lands. Hello, I'm Al Manghilas. Welcome to ASEAN in Focus. We're coming to you live from Manila in Thailand. Hello, Esther. Hi there, Alma, and good afternoon to all our viewers. I'm Esther Adano from BBC Thailand Bureau, bringing you the news in the dynamic ASEAN region. On today's headlines. Ousted Myanmar leader Aung San Suu Kyi returned to a junta court after skipping a previous hearing because she felt unwell. Myanmar villagers and anti-coup fighters have accused troops of burning hundreds of homes in the country's restive northwest as the hunt sea to crash resistance to its rule. In Thailand, the public health ministry is preparing to propose a relaxation of measures and start to live with the COVID-19 as opposed to lockdowns and strict curbs. Representative. So when the Los we... Angeles Consul General are urging Filipinos to sign up and vote for the upcoming May 2022 national and local elections. Pull them and canvas them. First in our news, ousted Myanmar leader Aung San Suu Kyi returned to a junta court after skipping a previous hearing because she felt unwell. She skipped Thursday's hearing in her trial on charges of breaching the Official Secrets Act because she felt dizzy, according to a source with the knowledge of the case. Detained Australian academic Sean Turnell is a co-defendant along Suu Kyi in that case. Suu Kyi returned on Friday for the latest hearing in one of her corruption trials related to the leasing of a helicopter. On Thursday, the junta announced it had filed an 11th corruption charge against Suu Kyi for allegedly receiving $550,000 as a donation for a charity foundation named after her mother. She has already been sentenced to six years in jail for incitement against the military, breaching COVID rules and breaking a telecommunications law, although she will remain under house arrest while she fights other charges. Suu Kyi has been detained since her civilian government was ousted in a coup last year that um, triggered mass protests and a bloody military crackdown with more than 1,500 civilians killed, according to a local monitoring group. Australia's foreign minister called Sunday for the immediate release of economist Sean Turnell, who has been detained by Myanmar's military junta for the past year. Turnell, an Australian econo economics professor, was working as an advisor to civilian leader Aung San Suu Kyi when he was arrested last February, just days after a military coup. He has been charged with violating Myanmar's official secrets law and faces a maximum penalty of 14 years in prison if found guilty. Professor Turnell's detention is unjust and we reject the allegations against him. We once again call for Professor Turnell's immediate release. Australian Foreign Minister Maurice Payne said in a statement, Human rights groups have raised concerns about Turnell's prosecution, particularly after Australian Embassy was denied access to his court hearing in September. Turnell was in the middle of a phone interview with the BBC when he was detained after the coup. In other news, Myanmar villagers and anti-coup fighters have accused troops of burning hundreds of homes in the country's restive northwest as the junta seeks to crush resistance to its rule. A woman from Bin village in the Saigang region, which has seen recent clashes, said troops had arrived in the early hours of Monday. They shelled artillery and fired guns before coming in, she said on Friday, adding that she, this, the sound had sent villagers fleeing. Troops then set fire to around 200 houses, including her own, she said, requesting anonymity. We couldn't bring anything with us. We took some warm clothes only, and then we just ran away. 
Troops also torch houses in nearby In Mate village after a local pro junta militia was attacked by anti coup fighters who then fled, according to one of the rebels. Local media also reported that hundreds of homes had been razed in the two villages and images obtained by AFP purporting to be of Bin Village showed the remains of dozens of burnt-out buildings. AFP couldn't independently verify the reports from the remote region. The fires consumed properties, motorbikes, and carts, said another local who was helping to coordinate aid for those displaced from In Maite. For them, it will be difficult to regain their livelihoods, he said, again requesting anonymity. State-run TV ran a report on Thursday accusing PDF fighters of starting the fires and published images it claimed showed burnt-out buildings destroyed by terrorists. In August, the junta said it was considering raising village militias to combat opposition to its rule as it struggles to assert control over swathes of the country. Sa Gang has been regular or has seen regular clashes and bloody reprisals. A former staffer at Australia's embassy in Bangkok has been charged after spy cameras were found in women's bathroom at the mission, a Canberra official said Saturday. Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade confirmed that the Royal Thai Police had arrested a local former employee last month. Kemarin Hasiri, commander of the Foreign Affairs Division, of Royal Thai Police said the Australian Embassy filed a complaint against a man on January 6. Thai Police said the investigation was ongoing. It is unclear how long the cameras had been in the bathrooms, with the matter only coming to light after a camera SD card was found on the bathroom floor last year, according to a report by ABC Australia. The suspect has been released on bail. Hugh White, Emeritus Professor of Strategic Studies at the Australian National University, said if security was lax enough to allow devices like cameras to be installed anywhere within a secure area, it suggests it's not tight enough to keep the embassy secure. In other news, the Philippine National Police Anti-Cybercrime Group, or PNP, ACG, denied claims of politicking in its investigation into the alleged assassination plot against presidential aspirant Ferdinand or Bongbong Marcus Jr. PNP ACG spokesperson Lieutenant Michelle Sabino said in a statement Sunday night that the PNP as a whole is an organization that is non-partisan and has no involvement or interest whatsoever in any political affairs involving poll bets. Sabino said, when we receive efforts or reports and complaints, we investigate and validate to check its truthfulness and accuracy, and then we gather evidence and facts. And if warranted, we pursue the filing of appropriate complaints in the proper courts. Such is always the case. Now, this came after the Kabataan party this earlier scored the Department of Justice and the ACG for linking them to the alleged assassination plot on video sharing app TikTok. Sabino also clarified that while they merely stated the facts when they said that the TikTok account, the LJ Luna 7, was following the party list group, they did not say that the group was involved in the plot. PNP ACG Chief Brigadier General Robert Rodriguez earlier said the account under the name LJ Luna 7 had been deleted, but digital forensic experts were able to save the account's electronic footprint, which will serve as evidence of the crime committed. TikTok earlier said the account involved in the alleged assassination plot against Marcus has been permanently banned from its platform. Now let's go over here in Thailand, where the Public Health Ministry is preparing to propose a relaxation of measures and start to live with COVID-19 as opposed to lockdowns and street curbs. Here's John Merle Baldo from Thailand Bureau. Hi, John Merle. Yes, hello, Esther. Thailand's Public Health Ministry will propose to lighten current policies prescribed by the Center for COVID-19 Situation or the CCSA. Dr. Opas Kankiwan Hong, an official of the Department of the Disease Control, however, did not mention the details on how these measures will be relaxed, but instead said that the country is moving in line with trend elsewhere, 
in spite of spiking number of cases in many countries. He insisted that lockdowns should not be considered because the average daily cases are still considered safe. He highlighted that Omicron may have high transmission rate, but its severe effects are no way comparable to that of the Delta. He added that the population has already lived with the virus for two years already, and it is about time to move on together. In an interview, the official said that the home isolation measure for patients with mild symptoms has been proven effective in keeping hospital beds reserved for patients showing more symptoms of the disease. The most recent deaths were attributed to people who are not yet given booster shots and those considered at high risk of contracting the disease, such as people aged 60 years or older, people with chronic illnesses, and those pregnant women. He urged guardians of the children to consider their children being vaccinated against the COVID-19. For COVID-19 statistics update, Thailand logged 10,470 new cases, including 166 imported ones and 12 new deaths. It also logged 8,711 patients being discharged from hospitals and 92,784 others still being treated. Back to you, Esther. Thank you so much, John Merle, for your time. Please stay safe and stay healthy. You stay safe to reporting live from EBC Thailand Bureau. I am John Merle. Bundad Baldo and we live in interesting times. Now, with barely a month to meet the deadline for complying with sea safety standards, officials of the Maritime Industry Authority or Marina and the Commission of Higher Education or CHED flew to Belgium for meetings with the European Commission. Their mission, salvage the jobs of thousands of Filipino seafarers employed in European flagged ships and vessels, maritime industry, and diplomatic sources told Business Mirror. Marina estimates 50,000 Filipinos are working in EU member flagged ships, mostly from Malta, Greece, Norway, and Germany. According to the EU, one out of five foreign crew members in the EU flagged ships are Filipinos. The seven-man delegation led by Marina Chief Vice Admiral Robert M. Pedrad will have an audience with the EC to seek clarification on the serious deficiencies identified in the 2020 audit by the European Maritime Safety Agency or EMSA. After a dialogue with EC auditors in Brussels, Marina and CHED have until March 10 this year to show compliance measures that have been operation operationalized. In other news, at least 13 people were killed and dozens more injured after a tour bus carrying factory workers to a beach holiday crash on Indonesia's Java Island, according to police. The bus and its 47 passengers were headed from Sukoharjo in central Java to a family gathering in neighboring Yogyakarta province when the driver lost control going downhill. Witnesses we questioned said they saw the driver panicking as he tried to manage the gear stick, so there's an indication that the brake was not functioning or faulty. Bantul District Police Chief Isan, who like many Indonesians uses only one name, told a media briefing. 13 people died, some died on the scene, and others died while being treated in the hospital, while 34 others were injured, Isan said adding the injured had been taken to three nearby hospitals. The driver was among those who died when the bus tipped over and slammed into the side of the road, destroying the front of the vehicle and badly damaging its right side. Multiple passengers sustained head injuries and three toddlers were also hurt, according to the police chief. Deadly traffic accidents are common in the archipelago nation of 270 million, where vehicles are often old and poorly maintained and road rules are routinely ignored. In other news, President Joe Biden has selected career diplomat Mary Kay Loss Carlson as the next U.S. ambassador to the Philippines, according to the White House, announcing this last Friday. 
The position had been vacant for more than a year since Sung Kim ended his four-year tour of duty in Manila in October 2020. Heather Varieva has been ad interim charge d'affaires at the U.S. Embassy in Manila since September last year, succeeding John Law. CDA is an embassy's official representative in the absence of an ambassador. Carlson currently serves as Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Previously, she worked as Deputy Chief of Mission in New Delhi, India for three years and as Ad Interim City A for 10 months and as Principal Deputy Executive Secretary of the Secretary of State in Washington, D.C. She has been a Foreign Service Officer since 1985 after earning her degree in Spanish and International Studies from Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee and Master of Arts in International Relations from Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. She also served at diplomatic missions in China, Ukraine, Hong Kong, Mozambique, Kenya and the Dominican Republic. And the news continues here on ASEAN in Focus. Esther and I will be back right after this. Alam namin ang iyong pagsisikap. Dama namin ang iyong mga sakripisyo. Kita namin ang paghirap mo sa bawat pagsubok. Kaya sa kabila ng mga hamon ng buhay, nandito kami para umalalay. Kasi katulad mo, gusto rin namin ang magandang bukas para sa kanya. Hatid namin ang dekalidad na edukasyon at makabagong pasilidad sa abot kayang halaga. Kaya huwag ka na mangamba. Sasamahan ka namin ito pa rin ang mga pangarap niya. Maaasahan mong sulit dito ang mga pinagsikapan mo. Sa aming mga makabagong pasilidad at sistema ng edukasyon. May lalabas natin ang aking talino at mga kakayahan niya. Kahit sa munting halaga, makakasiguro ka na makakasabay siya sa mabilis na pag-ikot ng mundo. Sa inyong ira, karamay mo kami sa bawat hamon. Kaagapay mo kami sa bawat hakbang. Kasama mo kami sa bawat niti at tagumpay. OPM hits as we play them on air and online from music videos. Yeah, we gonna go up. Ibibigay ko ang aking puso. Yung tingin pa lang ako ay natunaw na. To entertaining live and home performances of your favorite Pinoy artists. Now every step we take, how do we break? There's nothing we can do to do. do. Hashtag Sound Trip and Chill. Kasama ang Barkada, ang Letters and Music, Saturday and Sunday, 1 p.m. only on Net 25. Welcome back. Clinical trials are ongoing on the possible use of oral pill molnupiravir as prophylaxis to prevent an exposed person from contracting COVID. Dr. Benjamin Ko, the clinical investigator of the Move Head Clinical Trial at the Asian Hospital and Medical Center, or AHMC, said the AH AHMC in Alabang, Mundilupa, and Quirino Memorial Medical Center in Project 4, Kazan City, have been conducting the studies since November last year. Let's watch this. Ang 
clinical trial po na ginagawa natin ngayon ay sa bagong indikasyon. Ang ibig sabihin nun ay when we say it, it has not been proven na pwede natin gamitin ito for post-exposure prophylaxis. Mm -hmm. At ito po ang tinitignan natin ngayon. Mm -hmm. Pwede ba itong magamit as post-exposure prophylaxis? Mm -hmm. Ang ibig sabihin po ng post-exposure prophylaxis ay kung Kunyari ako, no, meron akong COVID at na-expose po kayo sa akin, ay maaari na po kayong, maaari na ba kayong uminom ng mm. molnupiravir para hindi kayo magkaroon mm -hmm. ng infeksyon. Nang, naka, ang kasali po sa clinical trial ng post-exposure prophylaxis, lo apat na bansa sa Asia ang kasama dito. So that's Japan, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Thailand po. Ito po yung mga may comorbidities. Ang importante lang po, no, yun lang ang hinahabol namin, yung mga na-expose doon mm -hmm. sa may mga may, may COVID. Mm -hmm. So, kunyari, ang meron kayo sa pamilya na may COVID at na-expose po kayo, kailangan po doon sa mga na-expose ay hindi pa po one, nababakunahan, mm -hmm. two, hindi pa po nagkakaroon ng COVID in the past. Mm -hmm. And three, they should be more than 18 years old. So if they fulfill those criteria, they can contact us at 0968-558-3091 or 0927-007-6602. Okay. Tapos kami na pong bahalang um, mag-assess kung kwalip sa clinical trial na to. The oral treatment called molnupiravir is taken within five days of symptoms onset and was shown in a pre-Omicron trial of 1,400 participants to reduce COVID hospitalizations and deaths by 30% among at-risk people. Eight capsules of molnupiravir are taken orally for five days for a total of 40 capsules. The government of Vietnam has tasked the Ministry of Health to purchase 21.9 million doses of Pfizer COVID vaccines for children aged between 5 to under 12 years of age. Vietnam has achieved very high vaccination coverage, which is largely credited to the country's strong commitment and the fact that the people themselves understood the power of vaccination to protect overburdened health hospitals or systems and from uh, the health of their loved ones. Uh, to protect the health of their loved ones. UNICEF representative in Vietnam, Rana Flowers, in her recent interview with the VGP said that the country has exhibited amazing commitment and solidarity towards COVID-19 vaccination and as a result managed to secure large quantities of various COVID-19 vaccine products. Meanwhile, President Rodrigo Roa Duterte has completed the mandatory five-day quarantine period after being exposed to a COVID-positive stat. Acting Presidential Spokesperson Carlo Bino Grales issued a statement just only a day after announcing Duterte was quarantined following his exposure to the infected member of his household on January 28. Health Undersecretary Maria Rosario Vergere also confirmed that the decision of the president's doctor on the matter was in line with their quarantine protocols. Nograles also corrected his previous statement that the president had another exposure to a COVID-19 positive patient last Sunday. Following the completion of his quarantine, Duterte is expected to resume his talk to the people or TTTP, his regular public address, by next Monday, according to Nograles. Crucial changes are needed to protect workers' health while teleworking, according to two UN agencies. Take a look. In a new brief, the World Health Organization and the International Labor Organization outlined the benefits and risks of working from home. Among the benefits are an improved work-life balance, flexible working hours, and less time spent commuting. It can also lead to higher productivity and lower operating costs. On the other hand, it can lead to isolation, depression, home violence, injuries, and an increase in smoking and alcohol consumption. 
According to the UN agencies, employers should ensure workers receive the right equipment, provide training to reduce the psychosocial and mental health impact, and establish the right to disconnect. Every year, the tobacco industry produces 6 trillion cigarettes containing filters mainly composed of microplastics. When broken down by sunlight and moisture, these plastics are released, along with heavy metals and many other chemicals, impacting ecosystem, health, and environmental services. Now, the UN Environment Program, or UNEP, has launched a new partnership to fight this problem, announced on Wednesday. According to the agency, cigarette butts are the most discarded waste item. They are also the most common plastic litter on beaches. When ingested, these microplastics cause long-term mortality in marine life. They can also enter the food chain and cause serious health issues, changing to genetics, brain development, respiration rates, and more. Scooping waste from a Malaysian river to stop it reaching the sea, solar-powered barge, the interceptor is the latest weapon in a global battle to rid the world's waters of plastic. Take a look. This is called interceptor. Interceptor, the main function is to trap waste, whatever waste pass through our log boom. It's complement our existing operation. Previously, Sungai Klang is like a floating landfill. Lah. The, we have tire, we have teddy bear, we have uh, animals inside. The boat cannot go through. There's a lot of plastic in the in the river, and now you can see the river is generally free from floating debris. And the news continues here in Asia and in Focus. We will be back right after this. Maraming mga kaibigan. Kumain ka na? Di pa tol, busog pa ako. Paano ka magbubusog eh? Hindi ka pa makakain. Yung kaibigan mo may aso na hindi daw nangangagap. Yung kaibigan mo mahilig humugot. Hindi kasi mga tulog na maayos. Kakaisip sa'yo. Ready na ba sa bago nating game? Sin Zone! Wala akong ginagawang masama. Akala mo lang wala, pero meron! 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 Woo! Wow! Pili ka. Sino bang pipili ng 20? Hindi to nyo ako eh. Baka pinato na. Tatang panis, nakabol, videos! Kung kayo po ay may nais na itumbong sa inyong lugar, problema sa lipunan na gusto nyo pong paaksyonan, mag-text sa 0956-867-1833 o mag-email sa responde at net25.com. Pwede rin kayo magpadala ha, ng mensahe sa ating Facebook page 
at Net25 TV. Sabado, alas 6 hanggang alas 7 ng gabi. Ito ang Responde, Mata ng Mamamayan. Welcome back. Ensuring the continued reopening of the economy will benefit domestic inflation rate, which further slowed down to 3% in January 2022, an official of National Economic and Development Authority or NEDA said on Friday. NEDA Under Secretary Rosemary Edilion said, the sustained deceleration of domestic rate of price increases in January from month ago's 3.2% is among the positive economic developments in the domestic econom economy to date. Let's watch this. Uh, uh, slower ang ating inflation itong uh, January, 3%. Uh, going forward, ang, ang pinaka kumbaga, robust na, 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 na move talaga natin is to uh, revive the economy. Kasi kapag uh, marami ang magpo-produce, magkakaroon tayo ng maraming supply, ito ang talaga magpapastable ng ating, ano, 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 ating mga presyo. Now, sa nakita rin namin sa mga detalye nitong uh, ng price statistics na to, ang malaking, um, uh, malaking na nagdulot sa inflation is actually the meat inflation. No? Uh, kasama na rin dito yung fish inflation. And for this reason, uh, uh, magre-recommenda kami actually na i-extend yung validity ng Executive Orders 133 and then 134. Itong Executive Order na nagpapa... Nag, uh, in, i, uh, itinataas yung minimum access volume para makapag-import pa tayo ng, ano, ng, ng, uh, ng, ng pork. Uh, and then ibababa yung taripa. But at the same time, we're also working with Congress para ipasa yung uh, Livestock Development Competitiveness uh, Bill. No? Uh, ito kasi parang uh, a very, ano to, mga very aggressive measures para i-address yung ano, uh, ma-improve yung competitiveness ng ating uh, livestock se sector kasama na rin yung competitiveness ng corn industry. Kasi yung corn, ito yung nagiging feeds ng livestock natin, ng poultry natin, even fisheries. Southeast and East Asia are leading the world when it comes to cross-border paperless trade, a move that has reduced time and cost for movement of goods in the region. According to a recent report by the UN Economic and Social Commission, for Asia and the Pacific, or UNESCAP. In its Digital and Sustainable Trade Facilitation Global Report 2021, released this month, UNESCAP said the regions mentioned perform better in cross-border electronic exchange of trade-related documents, such as exchange of certificate of origin and sanitary and phytosanitary certifications. This is due to the continued efforts to develop the ASEAN Single Window, or ASW, which enables the cross-border electronic exchange of customs declarations, certificates, Certificates of origin and SP certificates according to the report. ASW is a regional initiative that seeks to expedite, expedite clearance and promote further economic integration among ASEAN members. According to the report, over 70% of the countries surveyed have taken steps to establish legal and regulatory frameworks for electronic transactions, but only 30% have fully put them in place. The UN agency with this urge countries to ramp up efforts for cross-border paperless trade given the potential benefits due to digitalization of trade procedures amounting to $600 billion in the Asia-Pacific. Asian markets fluctuated in early trade on Monday as a forecast-busting U.S. job report reinforced optimism that the world's top economy was well on the recovery track but also rump up interest rate hike expectations. The much-anticipated non-farm payrolls data on Friday saw the Labor Department sharply revi revise up the previous three months' readings while also revealing a wage growth surge. With all important inflation reports, this week tipped to show prices rising 
at a pace not seen for four decades, traders are becoming increasingly anguished about the U.S. central bank plans to bring them under control while being careful not to jeopardize the recovery. There is mounting talk that officials will have to hike borrowing costs at least four times this year, with some predicting as many as seven could be on the cards. The move to tighter policies, which is likely to start in March, will bring an end to the era of ultra-cheap cash that has helped fuel a near two-year market rally and that has been acting as a hefty weight on stocks at the start of the year. Asia was mixed in early exchanges. Shanghai led the gainers as investors returned from their week-long Lunar New Year break to play catch-up with a broadly strong week across world markets, while Singapore, Taipei, Jakarta were also in positive territory. However, Hong Kong dropped after surging more than 3% Friday, with Tokyo, Sydney, Seoul, and Manila also down. The Department of Agriculture said it has partnered with the private sector for the construction of a state-of-the-art sow breeder nucleus farm that will help accelerate the country's big repopulation efforts. The DA said Agriculture Secretary William Dar led the groundbreaking of a 5,000 sow-level breeder nucleus farm of JG Agro Ventures, Inc. and Pig Improvement Company in Barangay Santa Ana or Santa Rita, Quezon, Nueva Ecija. According to a Business Mirror report, to complement the nucleus farm, Farm, the DA said it will commit at least $80 million to speed up the country's hog repopulation efforts under its Integrated National Swine Production Initiatives for Recovery and Expansion or INSPIRE program. The DA said the National Livestock Program or NLP is already drafting a memorandum of agreement to formalize the partnership between the government and the two private entities. The DA disclosed that JG applied for a 2.5 billion peso loan from the Land Bank of the Philippines to bankroll the nucleus farm. Meanwhile, homegrown firm Figaro Coffee Group Incorporated said it is continuing its planned expansion for 2022 as it is optimistic that the country's economic recovery will gain traction this year. The company plans to open 29 Angels Pizza outlets, six Figaro Group Express multi-brand outlets, five Figaro coffee shops, and one Tianma's Taiwanese restaurant this year. As of January 21, Figaro Coffee Group operates a total of 109 stores. Justin Liu, the company's chairman, said they are optimistic that the economy will further improve this year with the alert levels coming down and vaccination drives by the government continuing with strength. Furthermore, he said he continued growth and strength outside Metro Manila, hence their new stores in Lipa, and Laguna. Italian speedster Enea Bastianini was fastest on day two of the MotoGP preseason test Sunday, clocking a new lap record at the Sepang Circuit in Malaysia. Outpacing 26 rivals, the Gresini racing rider took the lead with a lap time of uh, one minute. 58.131 seconds, beating second place Alex Espargaro by a mere 0.026 seconds. The 24-year-old previously finished 11th in the MotoGP Championships in 2021 and took the Moto2 crown in 2020. Commending his bike and his team, Bastianini said they had been working a lot in preparation for the Malaysia test, but we're now focused on next week's practice round in, in Indonesia. Bastianini was among 17 riders who recorded their fastest ever laps on the 5.543 kilometer track, all managing times under 1 minute 58 seconds, up from five riders achieving the feat the day before. Coming in a close second to Bastianini was Aprilias Espargaro, who set his own best time of 1 minute and 58.157 seconds, followed by Pramax 
Jorge Martin on 1 minute and 58.243 seconds. The event was Malaysia's first MotoGP test since before the COVID-19 pandemic, which led to the cancellation of three MotoGP events in 2020 and 2021 in the Southeast Asian country. In other news, Los Angeles Consul General are urging Filipinos to sign up and vote for the deadline of registration for the upcoming May 2022 national and local elections. Here's Eva Basalyahe for the report. In the heavily populated Filipino-American community in L.A., the Philippine Consulate General Los Angeles is reaching out to registered voters, encouraging them to cast their ballots for the upcoming Philippine presidential election. We have actually the biggest number, the biggest Filipino diaspora, not just in the United States, but uh, in the entire globe. Uh, under our jurisdiction, we have 1.3 million Filipinos and the majority of whom are, of course, in L.A. County. The upcoming uh, presidential elections this year is very important. It is a pivotal event, moment in our history, because as you know, we just went through, or we're still going through, a global pandemic. The economy of the country has been affected severely. So the challenge really is for the next president to uh, make sure that we recover uh, swiftly, but also effectively to bring back our country into its uh, normal footing. The main challenge is to provide jobs, create jobs, more jobs to our, our people, and to make sure that we'll, we minimize, if not totally eliminate, these ill effects of the pandemic. The voting period actually for overseas voters starts a month earlier than in the Philippines. So overseas, the voting period, meaning the, the day, the period during which they can actually cast their votes, starts on April 9 up to May 8, meaning that the uh, registered voters will send in their ballots to the Philippine consulates. The ballots will be coming from Comelec. Comelec will be sending these ballots to us, the consulate. We have here what we call the special ballot reception and custody group, when we receive all those ballots, they will sort it out and send those ballots to the registered forwarding address of all the registered voters. You receive your ballot from us, not directly from the Comelec, but from us. You will now send it back to us, properly filled out, indicating the candidates that you choose uh, for whatever position, or national position anyway, meaning presidential, senator, and party list representatives. So when we receive all those ballots from all the voters, from the more than 32,000, assuming all vote. Then we will uh, assemble them and canvas them on May 9, which is election day. Synchronize yan sa Pilipinas. After tallying all the votes here, we will bring the results to the Philippine Embassy in Washington, D.C., where the Washington will, be, will serve as the overall canvasser for votes in the United States. And then it's the embassy that will bring the uh, tallied votes from the U.S. to the Philippines. This 2022, we have registered a total of 37,000. And if we are going by the historical trend, wherein you're only expecting about 15% turnout, then we would be expecting only about 5,000 votes coming from under our jurisdiction. I think that in terms of the actual casting of ballots, the pandemic should not be a problem because you are now just going to send it by mail. But then, even if that's the case, I think there's, there needs to be a more intense campaigning, not just among us government officials here, but also among the, the, the candidates themselves to encourage voters to really cast their, their votes come election day so that they will exercise the right of suffrage, which is constitutionally guaranteed, in terms of actually casting your vote. Did you actually register so that you will really have a say in the way our country is going to be governed for the next six years? The vote of the overseas Filipino, whether they are in the U.S. or in other part of the world, is as important as the vote of any Filipino back home. Pareho lang yan. Ang bilang isa lang. So whether you're abroad, 
or in the Philippines, it is important for you to vote, to exercise your right of suffrage, because that is the mechanism given to you by our constitution by which you can directly participate in the way our country is going to be governed. Please exercise your right of suffrage. Do not pass up on the opportunity. This is your chance to really express your opinion what you think and who you think should lead our country for the next six years. Engage with your fellow Filipinos by discussing issues, not so much the personalities. Ordinary minds talk about people, right? Brilliant minds talk about issues. The prevailing message from the Philippine Consulate General Los Angeles is that no matter where in the world a registered voter is, each vote carries the same weight, which in turn guarantees that every voter's voice can be heard. Eva Pasayaje, Eagle News, Los Angeles. Thank you, Eva, and thank you, Esther, for keeping me company here on ASEAN in Focus. Keep safe, always. You're always welcome, Alma, and keep safe as well. And that is the latest news in the Southeast Asian region. Thank you for joining us today here in ASEAN in Focus. I'm Esther Danga from Thailand Bureau, and we live in interesting times. And we'll see you back tomorrow, same time, same place, here on ASEAN in Focus. Stay in the news because we live in interesting times. Sayo, pagka nagkaroon ka ng 100,000 or 60,000 or 40,000, anong gagawin mo sa pera? Sa pag-aaral po ng dalawang